One, one, one. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Swedish Chamber of Commerce uh, business breakfast and very long introductory um, topic, experimenting and testing new ideas in the Baltics. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the hosts, uh, our partners at uh, Swedish Chamber, Swedbank and the Rocket Center. Um, a uh, beautiful location to enjoy the morning and some ideas. Uh, I have a long speech to, to say, but uh, uh, the, the main partner of this event is, of course, Catalyst Ventures, and Alex will be running this show for us all today. Few, few, few things about um, innovations in Sweden. Uh, according to the European Innovation Scoreboard 2019, Sweden is ranked as a number one innovation leader in the world. Uh, meanwhile, Lithuania is number 21, Latvia is number 24, um, and uh, we're quite moderate innovators. Um, and of course, it's a uh, it's very, uh, very important topic for, for all of us in Lithuania because we understand that the salaries are growing, um, the technologies are impacting the change, and we need to create more innovative products and services to be competitive worldwide and as well to be able to pay good salaries to our uh, employees, which is very important. And the fight for talent is qu quite hard. Um, we're very proud that Lithuania now had a surplus last year of uh, people who are coming into Lithuania, although 80%, 8-0 uh, of that is workers. So this is actually a very important part of uh, how to drive innovations forward. But uh, I hope you will enjoy the, the session today. And without further ado, I give the word to Alex. Thanks very much. Good morning and uh, welcome. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at uh, Rocket on this uh, slightly gray and, uh, and cold morning. But nice to be inside and see you all warm and some smiles, uh, some, some coffee people have had. and. Uh, yeah, it uh, looks nice and cozy on the, uh, on the stairs there as well. So, uh, a few, few words about us. Uh, so, Catalyst Ventures, we are um, a, a hybrid accelerator and investment fund, and we're working to promote the development of triple top-line companies. So, that means that companies that are having a positive impact on the three Ps. So, that's people, planet, and profit. So, we're promoting uh, businesses that are ultimately sustainable, and wanting to grow and make Lithuania a more resilient place. And we're doing that both with startups, but also with corporates and larger companies as well. So yes, I'm Alex, I'm a, I'm a partner of Catalyst Adventures, and I'll be, uh, I'll be hosting and moderating uh, the, uh, the presentations this morning. We've got a couple of great speakers. Um, the, uh, we'll, there will not be a chance to ask questions directly during the presentations or straight after them. So I really encourage you to use the time during the coffee breaks and the networking at the end so that you actually have a chance to go and interact directly and ask the questions that you want to the, uh, to the different speakers. We have two real objectives today. Uh, first of all, it is to share some best practice. So I think we'll see some really good examples of the kind of innovation that's happening here in the, in the Baltics, especially in Lithuania, um, but also to give you some, in some inspiration and a chance to think about what, uh, what innovation means for you and for your companies too. And the thing is that innovation has become a little bit of a buzzword in the, in the last few years. So I'd like to, to sort of take it back and bring it down to a very practical level very quickly before we, uh, before we begin. And I'll share a little story about uh, innovation for me and, uh, and what it means for, for me. So I remember when I, was, uh, when I was a child and I really dreamt of having a table football game. So if you've, you might have seen these in, in bars, you know, very, uh, a lot of fun to, to play with. And my parents said, no, I'm, we're, you know, we're not giving you this, uh, this table football game. It's too big. It's too heavy. It's too expensive. You know, sorry, it's not going to happen. And, and I thought, well, well, maybe I can make my own one. And so I took a, a cardboard box, probably about this big. I took some bamboo sticks from the garden. I took the inside of a toilet, uh, toilet roll, so the toilet tube, and I pushed the, the bamboo sticks through the, uh, through the toilet roll holders, painted little, uh, little pictures on them, and then took a ping pong ball and put that in the box, and I'd made my own table football. So that for me was a, was a very simple and effective 
way of, uh, of innovating and creating something new. And of course, innovating doesn't just mean creating new things or in their own way, but it can be anything from a system or a process uh, and beyond. So I just invite you for a second, just reflect for yourselves, what was the last time that you innovated, that you created something new in your personal or professional lives? Whether it's in the hotel business, whether it's in industry, whether it's at home. So just think about that in terms of you know, what innovation means for you and then compare to some of the great speakers that we have today and think about what innovation means for them and how you can actually take some ideas uh, and enhance your lives. So now I would like to hand over to my uh, partner Arvidas from Catalyst Adventures as well, who's gonna talk to us about innovation in the Baltics. And the clicker is right here, not this one. And uh, Arvidas is going to talk to us about why companies innovate in the Baltic and give us some concrete examples. Welcome, Arvidas. Thank you. Let me start with two things to admit, actually. The first one is my wife is not here. I need to admit I'm in love with innovation, so that's okay. She doesn't hear me. So. And the next one, actually, when thinking about the topic of today, we decided to skip word innovation out of the topic. And I can't agree with Alex more. It became a buzzword today. Uh, and lots of companies are using that just for PR and marketing reasons and creating this innovation theaters around. So our mission today is to show how innovation can uh, build a real value for real businesses and uh, to hear some interesting stories. So this is me. Oh, sorry. Uh, I started my innovation story like seven years ago. I accidentally went to innovation campus for two weeks and uh, uh, afterwards I understood that that's the only place I want to be there. And uh, actually uh, first few years was in corporate, uh, trying to change big organization towards innovation. And later on I joined Catalyst Ventures and uh, Today, more or less, I'm working with both startups and, and, and existing companies, but my main goal and main aim is to help existing companies uh, to connect with both startups, technologies, new trends, and, and help them to reach really business, business results. And uh, Alex told about Catalyst Ventures already, so I will not uh, uh, expand myself. Just going deeper to business innovation, uh, with existing companies. So we work with uh, companies who have some goals to either disrupt their business or to change their business model. Uh, and uh, we work with many industries and uh, the trends are quite the same. No matter which, which uh, company we talk about and which sector we talk about, uh, in all of these companies due to either regulation changes or new competitors or new technologies in town, we need to do something. And actually, we can use innovation as a framework to reach really great results. Uh, so, it seems exciting and, you know, like this plane in the middle of woods, usually when we're talking with companies for the first time, we're all excited. We think, okay, nice. Let's do, let's innovate. But that's the exception, that's the kind of how we feel about it. Actually, in real life, if you really want to innovate and uh, change something bigger, it's hard. And uh, that's where we see that expectation meets reality. And uh, many companies seeing that reality decides that innovation is not their path. And I had a story, from, from last week, uh, one company came to us and uh, said that we want to, to run a new innovation program. And we talked a bit and um, seeing that we are not preparing enough and that we are not just getting some fun, I'm, I just asked, so what's the goal of this innovation program? Do you want to have fun or you want to have achieve real business results? Oh, this owner thought about it and said that, oh yeah, we want some business results. 
So then I asked, so why you are you know, preparing to have fun if you want to reach business results? So this is a very important question to ask for all of you before innovating why you are doing that and then things will come. And uh, we see three real reasons or three kind of areas where innovation can help as a framework. So it's either creating new products you did not create before or you are growing your business uh, much in, in, in bigger terms than, 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 than five or 10 percent, or the third one if you feel that your business might be disrupted. And I will go each situation and tell you a few examples. So first of all, uh, one company we had experience with, they were a very strong company in B2B business today, but the situation due to regulatory changes, they wanted to go to B2C business. And uh, despite of their good wishes and will, I mean, they don't have any resources, any know-how, any understanding of that business. So you know, we question what to do, how to act. I mean, uh, the projects on the table are quite expensive and, and, and how not to kind of run anything and, and, and how, to, how to move forward. So in this situation, innovation framework worked for them. Another situation when you want to grow a lot. Another company from, uh, from our example, uh, the one who is, again, very successful one, growing 5 to 10% each year, uh, quite a big one, but their intention is to play in a bit different league. They want to increase their revenues by 100% to be there. And the existing business model doesn't support it. So, you know, they can hire a bit more new people, they can uh, expand their value, but it will not help. So what to do then? How to act in that situation? And the third kind of uh, area, this is the hardest thing to admit for companies when we see that either their business decline today or it will decline maybe you know, in the future. And again, one example we had is a successful distribution company today. Uh, which feels that in five years things will change. Amazon is coming and they say, I mean, we will not have the same situation. But today, uh, you know, they're very successful. They have no extra resources because everyone is kind of working on their daily tasks. And we have 100 plus ideas how to do things differently, but we don't have time to implement them. And also we need to put their priorities on top. So that's the hard part of them. So innovation framework, again, can help them in this situation. <clears throat> uh, so after, kind of, you know already that you have one of these three kind of challenges in your life, in your work. You know, it's easy, simple, yeah? Let's take any methodology out of there and let's implement and let's do innovation. Uh, fortunately, I don't have enough time today to talk about all of them but I will gladly do that over a cup of coffee either today or you know, any time when you want. Uh, but what I'm happy with that uh, companies today, we'll, we have six, six companies sorry, today to come and present their um, you know, stories uh, and present their types of innovation. So yeah, I wanted to be short and I am. I hopefully fit in this 10 minutes. So just to summarize what I wanted to say is that uh, you need to choose when you choose innovation. Either it will be innovation theater or it will help you to reach real as a results. It's possible and doable. Uh, you need to have a real kind of reason behind. And if you do, you will find a way. Thank you. Andre, one, one question for you while, you while you're still here. Uh, you mentioned lack of resources, uh, which is obviously a common, uh, common factor that you, you face when, when talking to companies. What would be your message to everyone in the audience today if everybody's feeling, or if anybody is feeling, you know, we have a real lack of resources, how can we innovate if we don't have resources? What would be your answer? One of the best examples and best ways to do that is to work with partners. And startups is one of the, one examples. We had a company uh, who had only maybe 50 people and everyone is busy 
uh, but we did an event with startups. We chose three ones to work with, and now we're working them. So it's, I mean, and we dedicate maybe, you know, for each startup, one person dedicates maybe 10% of time, and that's it. So we don't need to run big projects, you know, dedicate lots of resources. So it's possible and doable. But of course, first of all, we need to write the right partners to, to innovate with. Super. So starting small and finding the right partners, which brings us very, on, very nicely on to, uh, to our next speaker. So for those of you who uh, think of banks as big, closed uh, vaults, um, Yekaterina Bittos now, who is head of uh, startup partnerships at Swedbank, is going to, to talk us through uh, a little bit uh, and disclose some of the uh, fantastic secrets of, uh, of banking and let us know uh, all about open banking and how this works. Very warm welcome. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, Arvidas was talking about innovation. Uh, I know as well one more interesting word with the Asian word, uh, transformation. And the title of my presentation, From Secret Walls to Open Banking, sounds like a real transformation journey. It was quite a challenging to fit all, I would say that even more than 10 years of experience and, hist and story uh, to 10 minutes, but I'm tr I was trying to do my best to uh, make it interesting. And uh, let's start, let's see what secrets I can open for you today. So this is the selfie. My daughter made it when she was uh, at school during her class. And she's like romantically, sadly looking through the window and thinking that the real life, the real action, the real transformation, innovation, whatever happens uh, beyond the walls of the school. And I think that uh, you as well probably uh, have something similar sentiments when you sometimes catch yourself that life goes by and you're sitting and still struggling with some projects or um, some other presentation maybe, <laughs> and there is the carnival outside. So for me as well, the same, the same feelings, speaking about our strategies, our journey and transformation towards the nice innovative things for our customers. Because uh, I think that Already even more than 10 years ago, we started to think about some nice, uh, interesting products uh, which could uh, make our customers' life easier, that bring some joy and uh, smooth experience to the daily life. And with a strategy, I think, for the whole bunch of all the nice things like instant payments, payments based on telephone number, push notifications, and all nice biometrical stuff, easy experience, we have pulled and... Um, uh, compiled the nice strategy even before PSD2 actually came into the arena, so before the 2015. But we, I think that we were not too optimistic and we were quite realistic that the projects and are complicated and it will take a long time, a long journey when we uh, will deliver them. But we never expected that the journey will be such, you know, such a long way. Because speaking about, uh, there is the magic word proxy, so this uh, uh, payments based on telephone number, which probably many of you can enjoy on Revolut, or if you have a CB account, they have something similar in the in, in, in for the inner payments inside their app. So Swedbank doesn't have it yet. So <laughs> we started this project um, uh, in the 2013, so now seven years have passed, and I, holding my fingers crossed that this year we will have them. And with each and every strategical project, um, actually I was, um, for the past 10 years, I was working at Swedbank with the strategical projects and driving uh, these innovations, if I can call it so. Uh, but I'm not tending to blame myself as a bad uh, or not effective product, uh, project manager, but I blame for that this close banking. So imagine to make instant payments happen, first of all, you need some infrastructure. You need some clearing center which uh, enables uh, the international payments around Europe happen in less than three seconds. Okay, there was no infrastructure, but the infrastructure is in place, I think I will not mistake, uh, from 2000. Uh, 18 already or even the end of 2017 okay the infrastructure is in place but still there are no um, in not enough partners because if you are an if you learn how to make instant payments, you still need whom to send it, who is accepting it. So it's the tango which takes two. This is the second point. And the third point is that we have discovered, uh, speaking about these uh, uh, heavyweight protocols, these patented interfaces, uh, uh, and especially non-composability, uh, what we have discovered that 
when uh, you need to keep payments up and running during the night. So this process uh, requires the whole banking systems to be involved into the project because as you, as you probably don't know, but just believe me, the bank stops at night for the day change. So this day change process, it, it involves everything. Cards, payments, treasury accounting, and all this stuff. So this, due to this complexity, due to this close uh, how to say, infrastructure and system, so we were just unable to run some projects. And this is just one of the examples. And as a result, on the top of that, as a result of all that, we are truly like inaccessible to the third parties. And this is how uh, for, for, uh, for a long, for some time, uh, it actually played us uh, mm, well, uh, and we were so protective, and uh, um, we built some castle inside those brick walls, and this guy is, uh, as well as an illustration, how it could be protected from coronavirus. But this is something how we felt, how we are strongly protected, protected from the outside uh, environment. So, and this is, of course, for the reason, because we have secrets to keep. We have so many treasures. I will not stop much because since I have only 10 minutes, but just one simple example. Imagine probably you all know what account statement is and how many secrets are there, how many secrets are in the history of your payments. And you probably know that the PSD2 now uh, requires to open up this uh, secret information. So what is in this treasury vault? So uh, history of your payments, it means that this is an information where it's stored who is your beneficiary. Does he has the same surname? Maybe he is your family member, husband, the wife, the kids. Uh, how much do you shop? Where you shop? How often? Uh, or what amounts you spend? Uh, let's say if you have some credit products, uh, how much interest do you pay? And speaking about all products and pricing, if the fees apply, so basically looking into your account statement, we can tell how much these products cost you at the bank. Uh, do you have leasing? Do you have insurance? And all, all that interesting information is inside. And if we're lucky so, so much that customer pays utility bills from that account, so it's almost perfect 360 view to his daily activities, to his daily life. So keeping the customer's trust, and uh, making the infrastructure capable and stable. So we were keeping these treasures. And for a while, the competition between banks was something like um, the stadium and the round circle track. So same rules for ages, no any shortcuts. And to be faster, you probably needed to have some uh, fancier uh, running shoes or more experienced uh, coach. Uh, and pretty much success factor uh, to be a leader on the market for, let's say, for the private customer segment uh, was quite obvious. Uh, fish as many salary agreements than you can, attract the more customers with their salaries to the bank, so then they will open accounts, the money will come each month, then you will issue a payment card, he will take some cash, he will start shopping after all, and then keeping a contact because at one point he will need to see his account statement as well, so you will catch him and sell him some credit products, insurance, and so on and so forth. And actually, you probably remember the times, I think that if the, we have the people from uh, telecommunication companies uh, uh, here in the auditorium, so you remember this, that the calls or the payments inside the banks for uh, the customers inside one institution costed either zero or less than outside. So keeping and preserving customers in your own ecosystem so bringing their friends, families, and um, colleagues into one uh, company was quite beneficial. And this is how actually how, how we played. So basically summing it up, we were competing with each other by rules which actually were known for us for ages. So in order to make competition more interesting, <laughs> you know what has happened. So PSD2 upgrades rules a bit, some shortcuts and new techniques appear. So you see some new players appear. Some of them are too young and immature. They don't have, uh, they're not too fast yet. Their legs are not so long. But there are, of course, those who know how to charge electro scooter and they re they're really fast and really targeted and really shoot and drive the, cust the particular customer needs and start winning. So 
we have as well more disruptors and <laughs> probably uh, you can recognize whom I'm referring to into this picture. So these guys are using the old gaps underserved customers and making out of it the really fast tracks, delivering so nice interfaces that customers are crying, okay, how, how beautiful it is. They are the first who are introducing the biometrics to enter the application. They are the first who launch their um, push notifications for the card transactions. So everyone likes it, especially millennials and uh, all, all other youngsters. So this, this becomes really hard to compete with them because we are still running like this. We still only have the tools like new fancy sneakers or the experienced coaches. So <laughs> this seems, uh, if this doesn't seem to you as a drummer, so coming soon the global league athletes are ex expected. And here I would like to say one sentence about the friendship. So, you know, uh, here we were friends with our Svetbank Lithuania, Svetbank Latvia, and we were competing and making, uh, playing friendship in, in front of the other banks. Uh, here, uh, uh, so, sorry, uh, here the banks already have the, I don't want to call it cluster, but they started to play friendship against the fintech their payment institutions because that was okay we have our own rules that these guys know something else so let's be friends and let's see how we can protect our piece of the market and here speaking about the global players from the G le <laughs> G letter so maybe there is not a really a bad idea maybe it's even good idea which we're trying currently to experiment and to test to make friends on our local market with fintechs and startups and see what we can squeeze out and how we can protect our local markets in front of the global players yeah but uh, one more interesting thing about the platform this uh, word innovation is quite buzzword, the word platform as well. So when I heard first about the platform, for me it means actually uh, some environment uh, where you can reach the Hogwarts. So of course it would be nice if we could talk, if I could talk today with you um, about the banking sector in the same style as people talking about Apple, which is perfect platform for selling their uh, ap uh, mobile applications, or about Uber, where drivers meet riders and then the synergy, everyone is happy and blah blah. But um, I think that this illustration with a brick wall is the best at the moment, which can actually define how we feel today with uh, in front of the open banking. So it's still a wall made of bricks. Uh, and what about uh, making some nice windows? Yes, PSD2 has uh, actually uh, defined uh, how big the window shall be, uh, what color it should be, uh, how much information you could see for the window, shall it be with curtains or not, customer consent, and so on. But is it enough, uh, uh, this mandatory information that we need to open? Even these all nice things from the account statement is not enough if you cannot make something with it, if you don't have the proper APIs to, to connect. So customers still need personalized convenience services and uh, preferably that it's something as they have seen on Google, on Amazon, and maybe even on Netflix. Uh, and um, fundamentally nothing has changed yet, so ideas still need time and resources. And believe me, in the big bank like Swedbank or SCB or our, our other closest competitors, so we have so much stuff, stuff to do. And imagine how nice to have uh, those uh, uh, things which actually customers demanding at the moment. So what about making great open banking gates? Uh, this is the picture of the Swedish uh, gates in Riga and our colleagues from Latvia, they are making joke that uh, this is probably the best thing that uh, Swedes ever did done uh, to Latvians. So a gate, imagine the gate is much better than a window. I think you recognize uh, the rest of as well, yeah? This is Tallinn and this is our beloved Vilnius. So the gate is wider. You can even take some horses and ride inside and do some innovation. Uh, and obviously there are a lot, of, a lot of benefits and starting from the increased partnership opportunities which we're currently surfing and trying to squeeze out of that the maximum. Uh, then um, faster time to market, probably this is the thing which I'm praying uh, every day. So God, please make our time to market faster using the partners, uh, connecting them to APIs, uh, giving some parts of the services beyond the banking to them. Uh, 
and of course speaking about the global players and the changing models and the transformation so new monetization opportunities is as well a very important thing because together with the partners uh, with third parties between banks between customers if the benefits are mutual so there is a space where we could actually define new bu new business models so nice stuff uh, my time is up so it seems that it's easy, but it's not enough just to open the lock and comply to mandatory PSD2 requirements. It's much more important to keep your mind open for new ideas and to understand what inside of your castle, what could, could drive the innovation, what could bring new services, what could really make customers' life easier, what could solve particular problems, and how to find the uh, right partners with whom the benefits will be mutual so everyone can uh, prosper and as the name of our event I believe is experimenting and testing so I hope I encouraged you to open your mind and to experiment today so thank you so much for listening just just one oh, okay. one very good question okay. thanks very much Ekaterina that was great uh, you talked a lot about it being a long journey and going through. What would be your one piece of advice for anyone in the room who's about to start on a long journey? Uh, natural advice is patience and, of course, you know, learning from those disruptors. Because the journey is long just because we are a way too heavy and too complicated and too close. So looking to those who know how to shorten the journey and, uh, I don't know, coping with pride or learning from them, that could be a key. Super, great takeaways, many thank you, thanks. Okay, so next up uh, we have uh, Andrew Shemeshkevichus, it's the other, other yeah. clicker, yep, from, uh, from Telia, who's CTO there, and uh, he's uh, about to, to tell us all about uh, 5G, so uh, let's just do a quick check while we're doing the technical side. Hands up if you've heard about 5G. Hands up if you could stand up now and explain what it is. Easy. Aha. Over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm, I will be struggling now with 10 minutes because usually I give a presentation for 45 minutes or so. So let's, uh, let's move quickly to the presentation about those generations. What is 5G? Actually, it's fifth generation of mobile network technology. The third generation, maybe you remember in Lithuania, it was Comliet. It was uh, analog, and then second, third, and fourth, it was digital. So fifth, of course, is a digital. The main difference between the generations is, of course, that each generation was giving some, some new benefits, new capabilities, etc. and 5G will connect everything, as we say. Uh, but you know, we have our opinion in, in uh, the ones uh, working in telco industry. Sometimes you know those buzzwords, uh, and the ones are familiar with Gartner hype, uh, let's say curve, they understand that now it's in the hype. After probably a few years, it will go a little bit down because not everything will be connected so quickly. So let's see, year 2016, internally it was already Telia, externally it was still Omnitel. Uh, we did the first step towards uh, 5G. It was uh, a launch of 4.5G, uh, so actually half of the 5G. And we managed to achieve this uh, tremendous speed, 750 megabits per second. That's very big speed, I have to say, on the mobile network. The interesting part is that, look at the antenna. At this one, it was three meters long on the car, and the device, normally you have a phone right in your hand. So the device was this one. It needed a special power, so the engine of a car was running just to feed the, the device, so to say. And the distance from the base station to the car was roughly 300 meters, maybe, because the base station was on much with this, uh, on much with this building. Then, a uh, year ago, 2019, I'm standing with my phone in my hand, I'm getting 710 megabits, so almost the same, but no three meters antenna, no special power supply, my phone can last the, the day or even two sometimes. So you see, in three years, actually, the industry is changing so quickly, so from the big three meters antenna, everything is fitting into one, into one phone. Now, uh, end of year 2018, just before Christmas, Telia launched 5G in Lithuania. Uh, the launch was so-called non-commercial because the spectrum was not available at that time. So we were allowed to use the spectrum of 5G for a certain time, and we were not allowed to charge customers for, uh, for using the data. 
So actually we did it and as you can see we achieved roughly twice more speed than previously. It was uh, 1,800 megabits per second. That's amazing, right? But look at the device. The device was here. So it was another big box that is now transforming into smaller and smaller and soon we will have the phones that are capable to, to transmit this amount of data. So quite interesting, right? But uh, when I think about 5G and overall in telecom industry, is it chicken or egg at first? I liked the uh, I like this quote actually from Steve Jobs because he was thinking from the user perspective. He was not bringing technology to the, to the market, but he was talking that I need to find the problem I have to solve for the customer and then I will work on the technologies that can solve that problem. So does 5G solve any of the problems or it's opposite? The technology is created and now we are looking what kind of problem it can solve. Actually, it's a tricky question. Uh, no one has a good answer to it. <laughs> Uh, the main differences between 4G and 5G are written here, but let's say you, you, you need to remember three things. 5G is for speed, for better latency, and for bigger density. Bigger density means devi device density in, in square kilometer, for example. You can go up to one million of de connected devices with 5G, while 4G does not allow to, to have so many. Also the speed, uh, max throughput. Uh, 5G can use more spectrum, different spectrum bands can combine everything so you can achieve up to 20 gigabits still in the future. Today we are not able to achieve that speed but uh, let's say in a couple of years. And uh, latency, uh, latency goes let's say 10 times better compared to 3G. Latency is when I press the button how quickly signal goes to the server and returns back to me. So latency is important for gamers, for remote control, for anything what is live, where you need the real, real life uh, feedback. The rest is not so important and of course it would be nice to have those uh, fast running trains in Lithuania, 500 kilometer speed like in Japan, but we needed it. Okay, so 5G, 5G, we launched 5G, but actually our 5G and 5G in the world is like this baby. It cannot live without uh, its parents today. So this version of 5G that's available in the market, it's called uh, non-standalone, NSA, uh, because it heavily depends on 4G. So if you shut down 4G network, 5G will go down as well. So that's the main difference from the normal product, so to say. So it's the first phase of 5G. This year, the standard is maturing more and, uh, and equipment is already ready, but as the standard is maturing, the vendors are working on creating the software that is needed for, for this new standard. And um, one of the challenges we have with 5G, it's very technical illustration, I will try to explain. Uh, but let's say I have a 4G base station here and it provides the coverage like you see here. And then if you want to, to use this non-standalone 5G, we are putting base station the same or another one with 5G, but the coverage as you can see, it's much smaller. It means that if I'm moving from the phone from here to here, in this place I don't have 5G, in this place I have 5G. So the territory is much smaller, even taking the same amount of base stations. In the future, when we have a standalone, meaning that uh, the, the kid is grown up and it's independent, we can build similar coverage with 5G, but as you can see, we, we need approximately three times more base stations compared to the traditional 4G. So that's one of the challenges. Another challenge is, of course, uh, power consumption uh, because each 5G station consumes the same amount of, uh, of energy as all the rest in, in, in 2G, 3G, and 4G. Uh, roughly 2 kilowatts per, per base station. So per one year you can calculate 1,500 one base station just on energy. That's a big challenge. So these are the first steps of, of, of our 5G. We don't know how it will be in Lithuania due to the situation with Russia because Russia is using those frequencies for military purposes. So they do not allow Lithuania to use the same frequency as the rest of the Europe for 5G, saying no, no, switch to another one. But that another one is used by, by Russia, by China, by few countries only in the world. The rest of the Europe and the world using a frequency that is from uh, 3.4 to 3.8. So there is uh, ongoing negotiations uh, with Russians uh, if negotiations fail, it means roughly half of Lithuania is, is having uh, restrictions of 5G usage, proper 5G usage on that frequency. Let's say up to Kaunas, roughly 100 kilometers from Kaliningrad, there are restrictions. So it's a big challenge for us. 
uh, if you if you take uh, where we can use 5G, if you take this factory, it's very easy to understand that such factory with automation, with uh, autonomous vehicles bringing, I don't know, some goods from one end to another end, they need good connectivity. And for good connectivity, you can deploy 1,000 access points or just four base stations covering big territory and providing excellent coverage uh, within the, inside the buildings or, or outside the factory. If we take salmons in Norway, it's already in use, uh, the salmon farms, the high definition cameras are installed under the water and they're observing how the salmon's behaving. This video stream is sent to the cloud, cloud is analyzing artificial intelligence, deciding how to feed them more, less, uh, to adjust the frequency or not. That way they save a lot of, of, of money because the salmons are more healthy and growing faster. Uh, 5G for mining, we don't have mining in, in Lithuania, but in Europe there are places. Uh, it's used to, to remote control all these dangerous devices, not device with dangerous, but environment is dangerous. So the, the humans don't need to work in those harsh environments. Airports are starting to deploy it uh, because we're using automated systems and cetera, and utilities. So I'm pretty sure that in few years 5G will become this one, the grown up that is completely independent from 4G and it will be called, and it is called standalone. So remember, non-standalone is the current version, standalone is the future, maybe for the next year. Thank you. Thank you. So, so two, two very good questions for you. One, I think the killer question that we all want to know is when will we actually personally, individually experience 5G? Yeah, you can, you can go to some countries where it already exists or <laughs> we will switch it on again. <laughs> we just need to buy the permission to use it uh, because we have two base stations in Vilnius that okay. are 5G. Okay, mm. so, that, so that's one. And then the second one, uh, in very simple terms, for me, it's always a good test uh, how to describe something to my grandma. Right, so how would I describe 5G to my grandma when I call her tonight? Ooh, it's like a highway, you know. The normally you drive very slow road that's bumpy, you know, narrow. 5G is just a highway where you just speed and you know you have unlimited amount of lanes. Super, yeah. great explanation. Thank you very much. <laughs> so next up we have Dr. Andres Jogis. Yes. And uh, he's from the Sun Investment Group. And you're going to tell us all about remote solar consumer platforms. Warm welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me here in this uh, seminar. And I hope my uh, message uh, will be interesting for you and it will touch every one of, of you. Uh, I'm going, going to talk about a hot topic in nowadays. It's uh, renewable energy and uh, one of, of, of the sources, the sun, which is unlimited and can be used in uh, all of your houses, feeding with uh, the electricity. So a uh, colleague uh, has mentioned that Lithuania is somewhere in 21 or 22nd place according to the innovations, but perhaps uh, this, this matches, message will increase Lithuania several places up uh, but we will see. Uh, I am going to talk about the platform which allows uh, uh, people to use uh, green electricity which is produced in uh, your own uh, so, uh, solar system, which can be built somewhere uh, in, in Lithuania. It, it does not have to be uh, somewhere on your house. So let's go through and we will see. Uh, this, uh, is, uh, this is valid from 2018, first of October, when our government uh, adopted the law, which allows to produce electricity somewhere uh, geographically uh, distant from your house and use this electricity in your house or in your uh, company. So uh, this uh, innovation is quite new and uh, I didn't hear that any European country, country uh, has this ability. So Lithuania is the first one which, uh, which did this and uh, now uh, every one of us can, can be 100% uh, green uh, by using green electricity. 
So how it can happen? Uh, for example, uh, if we have a typical house, uh, the usage of electricity is something like uh, 10 kilowatt hours per, per month. And if we convert it to, to money, maybe it will be more, more clear. It's something like 100, uh, one, one, 130 euros per month. So that means that it would be enough something like 10 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt power uh, uh, solar system. And uh, this system will produce enough electricity for the whole year for, for your consumption. So uh, if, if telling shortly, we have a big uh, solar park which is built somewhere in, in, in Lithuania and you can buy a small, small part of this park, let's say 10 kilowatts, and this electricity usage produced in, in this solar park can be transferred to, to your home or to your company. So in this way, uh, we, we are using an uh, electricity network like an accumulator, which accumulates this electricity which is produced in, in the solar park, and uh, you can use uh, your electricity anytime you need, during, your, uh, during the night, during the day, uh, whenever you want. For example, now we, we have uh, illumination from, from the lamps, which use electricity, so this electricity could, could also be used from, from these parks. Uh, what are the benefits of, of this? So, uh, first benefit is, of course, you can reduce your uh, bills. For example, if you pay 100 euros per month, it can be something like 20 euros. So, uh, reduction is five, five times. Uh, this system is quite reliable uh, because uh, output warranty is uh, 25 years. And I will show you the payback period, which is uh, much smaller. So you have uh, warranty for, for this 25 years. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can be 100% green. It means uh, using electricity, you do not... Uh, emit CO2. So it's very important for, for the saving the climate because CO2 is, is, is not good. Uh, also, I have marked an uh, agency which supports uh, this and uh, gives subsidies for, for the residentials uh, to, to, to buy some, some part in solar park or to build your own uh, PV system uh, on, the, on the roof. Uh, okay, so what about the payback period? Uh, for the B2C segment, it, it varies between five and eight years. Uh, this period depends uh, on the price of electricity. Uh, I have checked the statistics, which say, says that uh, in Lithuania we have uh, almost the lowest price for the electricity comparing with EU countries. For example, now we have uh, the price which is something like uh, 14 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, if we compare, let's say, with Germany, th uh, there the price is uh, almost 30 cents. So the price difference is more than two times. So it's just... Uh, a little of time uh, when the, uh, the prices will increase in Lithuania. We had something like 15% increase this year, so uh, I'm sure that this increase will be and next year, next year, next year, when we'll have more or less the same price uh, like in other European countries. And uh, the, same is, uh, the same system can be used and for the industry or just for, for buildings like this. And here the payback period is something uh, like 10 or 12 years. And of course, it, it also depends uh, on the price of, of the electricity. If the price is higher, then the payback period is shorter. And uh, here are my contacts. If you have any questions during the break time, you can ask me and I, I will answer and maybe help you to, to become a green. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. 
So, so one quick question. Uh, I think uh, many of you might have seen that uh, Tesla uh, are planning to produce roof tiles that are essentially solar panels to go on your, on your roof. So the question is, are these real or is this a PR stunt? And if so, can we expect them in Lithuania and when? Yeah, uh, this is really real, but uh, everything depends on the, on the price. So uh, most of Lithuanian people live in, in the flats. So that's why it's quite complicated to use these tiles or some, something uh, on the roof. It's not enough uh, place. So that's why we are offering uh, solar parks. And for people who live in houses, of course, uh, if they have money and uh, if, if they want, we can cover uh, the roof with tiles, which will generate electricity and will be uh, cover of, of the roof. Super, and I'm sure you'll have uh, several people here talking to you during the, the coffee break. Uh, and talking of coffee breaks, it is now time for, for a short coffee break. We have about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so let's start, say, at uh, five minutes past uh, 10, uh, and then we'll carry on with the, uh, the next, uh, next couple of presentations. So coffee break here, back in 10, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, please come back. Welcome back, welcome back. Let's, uh, let's continue, please come back in. Can you get a big stick and chase everybody, please? I can push them from the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> come on, uh, come on back in. Welcome back. Come on, come on back in. Let's uh, let's continue. Justina, can you uh, drag everyone back in, please? Two of you, yeah. So I'll, I'll give you my I'll give you my microphone as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alex. Hey, nice to meet you. Great. This is you. Yeah. So I guess we can uh, continue. Welcome back after the, uh, after the coffee break. I uh, have the pleasure of uh, introducing our next guests. So we have Justus and uh, Povilus uh, from Tegra. Tegra State, I guess, is the, uh, the, the company name. And uh, they're going to talk us through uh, organizational chaos and how to harness the energy of organizations uh, to make good innovation and, uh, and progress. So warm welcome and over to you. Good morning. So today we already heard quite a lot about technology, 5G, 4G, solar energy. It was uh, very interesting indeed, thank you. Uh, but we're gonna talk uh, a bit more about uh, company culture. Uh, I'm a strong believer in a quote that uh, culture eats strategy for, for the breakfast. So, you know, uh, we, we can have uh, very smart processes, we can have uh, all these uh, methods of innovating, but if our people are resisting to innovation, uh, if they are very stiff, if they, if they think that uh, the market is going to be here forever, then we have a problem, doesn't matter how effective we have uh, internal processes. So from the first side, uh, we look like an ordinary company, uh, we actually have a Originally, we have been distributors. Uh, as mentioned before, in one presentation, distributors have plenty of uh, uh, challenges nowadays because, uh, you know, like Amazon, uh, Alibaba, uh, internet retailers are eating uh, some, some, some of the market. Of course, uh, big retail chains who have uh, their own private labels also uh, trying to throw you out of the market. So you have plenty of challenges. Uh, our products basically are um, uh, building chemistry. You can see on the picture. Here we are participating in one of the exhibition fairs. So like everybody is happy, we have the products, we have the uh, experiments. Um, but actually behind the scenes to bring out the best result and uh, to innovate every day, we have to do some uh, strange stuff, so to say some uh, stuff that can look like this. Uh, this is the video. Well, we have, uh, Justus will talk a, a bit more, but we have meetings Friday, let's say, some sessions. And uh, we try to do some uh, stuff that uh, goes out of your comfort zone and try to, to uh, you know, play with it. Uh, that's video. It, can can I, can we play it or is it? Uh, it's a great so basically, uh, what what uh, we are going to show here is uh, people uh, have like s some uh, some some uh, movement. 
Uh, they are passing this ball to each other and moving in some direction that they just learned. Nobody said that you have to move this way, but before the start, uh, we explain how you're going to do it. You heard it for the first time in your life, and then you are moving like this direction, passing the ball to that, picking the ball here, and so on, so on. So all the time, uh, anyway, okay. Uh, doesn't matter that much, but anyway, we, we have all the time some uh, things that you are able to try something new, uh, play with it. We invite actors to our company who uh, learn us to improvise. Let's say uh, we had uh, played a few times God of Poco, made by a famous Lithuanian actor, uh, uh, Andrius uh, Zebrauskas, and then we have uh, different things to move us from comfort zone. And why are we doing this uh, is basically a uh, famous dilemma of organizational chaos and order and where is the golden circle because there is two parts of it uh, and uh, when we have too much order in the organization and everybody knows what they are going to do today, tomorrow, after one year we have some problem that organization becomes too inflexible. It's uh, very inert. So uh, then you hear that after five years already change in the market, then they learn that something has changed in the market. So it's already too late. And if we have too much order and everybody is organized, and uh, when somebody mentioned that uh, let's devote at least 10% of our time to do something new, I totally agree to it. Because if we are uh, very structured, then we are become hostile to innovation. And we talk a few practices how we do that. And finally, uh, it's, it's fun uh, when we hear that people avoiding taking responsibility. It's very simple. If you do not make decisions every day by yourself, then you cannot take responsibility for that. If the manager decides every day what you have to do next, what is your direction, you cannot take responsibility for, the, for, for your actions. It's very simple. And uh, on, the other, on the other side is chaos. When sometimes it's too much of inefficiency, everybody doing their own thing. So we try to be somewhere in the middle and try to have of the both worlds. Let's say some days we are working very strictly, uh, process everything, and some days is a mess. So when people to come to our company, they say, how are you actually uh, achieving something, some results? Because we have no budgeting. We have no uh, duty description, so-called Lithuania and Paregini Nostate. And then people, at first, they don't know how the things are working here. But uh, some of who we, we balance here. And the uh, last thing, like a short story about order, we have a beautiful bank, uh, sweat bank, and we are clients for many years. We come for the meeting, it is like table, square, table, and we talk with our colleagues. Let's do opposite what we do every, every way. Let's sit one guy from my team in front of me and I'm behind the desk. And then the guys from the banks came and they look at us and say, what just happened? Like first time in 15 years, can you imagine a bank? First time in 15 years, somebody from the same group sit one end to the other. And then we had like team, you know, uh, looking each other at, at, at the table. 15 years, first time, everybody like sit. If we, we've used us come to the bank, we sit each other to and they say secret information, let's change and everything. So first time, can you imagine? That was small innovation to the bank. So uh, Eustace will, tell, uh, will uh, tell a bit uh, how does it work in everyday life and few practices that we can share in this short presentation. I have my microphone. Next. Okay. Uh, yesterday we were <laughs> speaking and uh, thinking what to show here and uh, decided to to mention few few things, what we have, uh, which are different from the others. So, 
uh, we have in our company we have uh, the circle of trust uh, we have three top managers six persons uh, in all so it's three top managers and uh, three employees and uh, the employees are uh, are selected by the, by other colleagues as most trusted so hmm. this year i was also elected here and the experience uh, was was really different from the others because uh, you have to make decisions such as uh, your colleague's salary. Yeah, you have the power to do that. Uh, but what uh, I'd like the most it was uh, listen my colleagues, uh, giving him feedback, and uh, I'd like to mention one example from this year. So uh, we had. Uh, we had meeting uh, with uh, one of the sales uh, manager of the region. So he told us that he has a, he has a hobby uh, like filming, making videos, and uh, airplanes photography as well. So he made a wish that uh, he'd like to to make a videos of our products for YouTube. So as a result, we have a few videos made of him and uh, 100,000 uh, viewers, yeah. And the next, maybe add, uh, you have something to add here. And then we talk about this uh, people taking responsibility for their decisions. So you can you imagine some guys like uh, there was chief accountant, IT guy, sales guy who are sitting and the, with top managers discussing some development of employees. They definitely feel like uh, owners of the decision, you know. Then they come back to, to, to the team and then they behave in, in a different way, for sure. Okay, and uh, the next thing that I think is the most excused in our company, so it's four days working week. Uh, I read Francis uh, was also mentioned that uh, they, they use it in, in their company, so <coughs> we have Friday's meetings, Paul has mentioned, and uh, it doesn't mean that we can <laughs> lay down in our bed at home uh, but we are sharing our ideas and uh, I think that the best thing is that we see the result after a long period for example after one year uh, we don't realize uh, we don't realize uh, uh, how to say while we are there on Fridays and we are discussing, we are creating uh, products and we, for example, before one year we made one hour new brand and the profit we, we are getting now, for example, yeah. About these uh, Friday meetings, what is also important that is uh, strategy being, uh, you know, change every week to some, some degree, let's say. We are hearing what people from the market say every week. We are hearing what feedback we're getting from the customers. We are hearing what mistakes we have uh, done. We are admitting some mistakes, we're learning from that. So that is uh, like learning organization, what is all about for us. And uh, we try to do some rhythm ev every week. Yeah, maybe the that's all about this. And of course, <laughs> the last one is that uh, why we are here at Swedish Chamber, because uh, we had one project uh, when we expand to, to Sweden, but, but for now, we concentrate on our main products, 
and uh, we are looking also for partners, mostly for distributors. So, if you can help us, so <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Big round of applause. So again, there's a chance to, to talk more during the coffee break, and if there are any enthusiastic distributors in the room who can help, then uh, of course speak to, to the guys. One quick question for you. You talked about you know, helping people to get out of their comfort zones. Uh, one of the things I did last, uh, last year was uh, I went on a course with a guy called the Iceman, Wim Hof, where I had to go and uh, spend a week uh, having ice baths. So each day in the morning after breakfast, we had to go and get into a, a bath of, uh, of iced water. So this was way out of my comfort zone. Anything else that you'd like to share from your, your own experiences? You know, some, a, a lot of things, but let's say for some people it's very strange to try meditation for 10 minutes. You can imagine how hard for somebody who hasn't tried or think that is something about being crazy or stupid or so on. Some uh, simple, or we have like a game we call cat and mouse and then two, two guys have to take a hand, you know, of each other and yep. stand. And then there will be some companies, not ours anymore, but they say it's crazy. I cannot tell, it's like, yeah. it's not manhood is all about, you know? Yeah. So it's little things. Super, uh, and I think that's a really good message as well, that again, innovation can be these really small, symbolic little things that help you on a, on a journey. Thank you very much. <laughs> so our next speaker is from Cobalt Law Firm. Uh, Dr. Rimantis uh, Simaitis, so very warm welcome to you. Hello everyone, thank you for inviting us. Sure. Uh, sure. Thank you. Sure. Let us start with a short quiz. Uh, maybe some of you already have experiences with lawyers, if not, you have some stereotypes about lawyers. So let's balance a little bit, let's make a little bit. What would you your preference for your lawyer to be and to choose for you verified True path, uh, tried 110 uh, times, or innovative path for solution of your problems. So, who would vote for verified path in solving of your legal problem? Okay, innovative path. Ah, oh, there are people. You are brave ones. <laughs> uh, yeah, normally people choose the first option, and they're wise. Because uh, innovative paths in laws in, uh, and in, in making law, in applying law, might be dangerous, might be risky. And the first thing, the first principle for lawyer is to inform the client about the risk and to uh, let him avoid it. So it might be strange why we speak, uh, uh, when we are lawyers, when we speak about innovation. You can make progress and you can find your better ways in solving legal problems, and not only legal, but all problems together with laws, making smaller steps. Innovation in small steps, it, it already sounded here in this particular uh, seminar, but uh, I will use that secular uh, thing. I will come back to this idea uh, with my last slide, but let me start with uh, what we lawyers can do with innovation a part of, of offering uh, our clients, uh, our partners, uh, our, well, corporation, network, uh, various uh, only verified paths and being uh, uh, serious, uh, uh, wisest people in the room as we are trained and maybe some, sometimes uh, introverts, uh, uh, egoistic, etc. As lawyers are trained at universities, as we were used to be trained at universities because currently it's changing is a new trend. And this new trend is connected to, uh, to the understanding that uh, currently all the society, everything what we do, technologies, and not only these, uh, well, hard technologies such as software and all other technologies, uh, uh, they are changing. But also the ways how we do, we do conventional things, they are moving gradually to, to the better, well, application things. Let me show you one example where we participated. How many of you have heard about uh, this word, mediation? Please raise your hands. Not everybody. 
Do you think in Lithuania it's a new phenomenon? Please raise your hands if yes. Yeah, somebody thinks. Uh, in fact, mediation is also innovative, te innovative technology, which is now for 30 years, and in Lithuania it's innovating. We're finding new ways how to experiment. From starting from this year, we in Lithuania, as a huge love of mediation, we invented uh, mandatory mediation in family matters where you cannot access court without trying mediation first. It's not an innovation on the global scale because uh, we're aware some states and some, uh, some societies who tried that before. In Lithuania, we do it our way and we do it in a new way for well, making these things. This is sort of innovation and we managed to participate in that. We promote it as well. Some colleagues from the office and myself personally. Another example, uh, how many of you know that in Lithuania, court files are not less than 70% in civil administrative cases digitalized? In Lithuania, we have a phenomena that court files, and we are very progressive states, if compared to other European states, 70% and more are only digital, paperless. Yeah? Did you know that? From 2013. And how it happened? The Lithuania National Court Administration in implementing of some laws, where, well, myself and colleagues of mine were able to draft these laws, uh, announced public tender for the vendors who would, could offer digitalization of court file software and implementation of that. It appeared that Cobalt and one of our partners, IT company, IT year, won that tender. And in one year, we did a miracle. We created the software, we implemented it. There were some obstructions, but now I can access my court files here and I, I can submit and upload documents to the courts using this device as well. So, small steps in innovation but making huge and big change. Um, and you saw the diagram, the previous diagram, this one. It is uh, from a quite new book of, of uh, a good colleague of mine, Michel De Stefano, professor at Harvard and professor at uh, Miami and IE University and some other universities. She's one of the greatest minds of, well, contemporary legal education and theory, who promotes innovation everywhere she goes. She does lots of international projects. And here is a pyramid she drafted in one of her books of, of legal, legal of evil, showing that innovation for lawyers can make clients more happy. But why it is on the, on the top of a pyramid? Because it's very difficult to go there. In order to achieve that level, you have to have this one. This is basic. Everybody is taught at the law schools, at the universities like this. And you are building up and up and up on top of these skills for your legal practice, for your education, for making your mind and your intellect more sharper. If you will be successful enough and eager enough to, to reach certain levels, you can reach that top level of innovation, and innovation here means providing your services and making very five path, paths for clients more sharper, more effective, making small innovations in whatever you do, how you provide legal services, and even a different phenomena when you start to collaborate with your clients of changing clients' way, understanding, perception, and procedures how we deal with legal issues, with legal problems, how we solve them. Uh, what we in Cobol do with innovation are part of these two projects I've mentioned. We do some. We were the first who launched, uh, uh, in cooperation with some partners, including Vilnius University, IATI, and some other partners, the first in history in the Baltics legal tech hackathon, in selecting ideas, what we can do for innovation in law. Uh, we do R&D, uh, we love startups, we cooperate with them, definitely we support them in making their legal, well, stories and issues become true, 
how to frame their business, how to uh, match with regulatory issues, how to uh, obtain license for doing various things such as electronic monetary issue, institution license and all that stuff. We do that, but that's regular thing. What we also do, we innovate how we provide law and legal services to our clients. We use lots of technologies in the way how we provide already law. We were the first ones, one of the first ones who started to test uh, application of artificial intelligence in provision of legal services and legal businesses. Frankly speaking, it's not very efficient yet, but we're testing, just playing to, to, to be ready. Then the strength of, this, of these devices, of these artificial intelligence tools will grow. We as well participate in drafting various ethical norms, how these artificial intelligence of choice now and maybe stronger devices shall be applied in legal practices in courts, in out of court legal businesses, etc. after they become more stronger. We also try to, well, sometimes find these small innovation additions to the verified paths to allow clients to achieve the same results better, more efficiently, less costly, and sometimes with more reliability because uh, law is not always uh, in black and white. When you know the practice how law operates, you know that normally even mandatory rules which are clearly cut and clearly enshrined on the paper, on stone, they can be interpreted, they can be construed in many different ways. And then you understand that law is gray. Not this one, not, not this gray, different gray, <laughs> of gray color. And then you have to innovate every time you go, you, get, you have to understand how these, well, interpretations of law can be used, can be employed to the benefit of law clients, of your clients, and not breaking the red line. Because making things innovation can, well, allow you to go beyond some lines, beyond some horizons, etc. For, for us lawyers and for your clients of lawyers can mean going beyond some line. If it is a red line enshrined in the criminal code or some administrative uh, uh, codes or whatever, that means infringement, quite serious. So we lawyers shall allow you not to cross that line. And this is a diagram from, from different source. We lawyers love sources, you know. From different source, which is uh, very ac acute now as well, how big law firms will change. Now we have pyramid extractions. Lots of, uh, well, junior lawyers, associate lawyers, senior lawyers, and partners on top. In the future, we are gradually moving to employing technology solutions. And that will lead us to that change, rocket structure. So lesser junior lawyers, more paralegals, more legal tech, more application of technologies will allow our clients and are allowing our clients to receive better services for less money, for in less time. And for the very last thing I would like to share to you, a quote from Michel de Stefano book that uh, innovation shall not mean always big things like TNT, like explosive, boom, bang, yes? Generally, innovation, you have to observe that, can mean as well TNT, but T for tiny and for noticeable things Another T for things that have lasted value. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Ramante. Uh, let me uh, just ask one question. We heard in the in the previous presentation uh, about the uh, you know when we move too much with order and that if there's not enough chaos or there's not that little bit of chaos to, to get the creativity. You come from an industry where you know, it's, it's all about the, the, the input of billing hours and so on. So to what extent is it a difficult cultural change 
to help people within the legal profession to make these small innovations that you said are also very valuable? I think it's the only way. Because uh, we lawyers, uh, we are very resistant to changing things. We are very conservative. And we have to be conservative because of reasons I already mentioned. So resistance is very high. And uh, well, there are some sectors where resistance is of a certain level. But lawyers, they are very defensive, very conservative. And that, that's why the only way to innovate in law is with very small steps, with TNT, but with a different meaning. The small, tiny, noticeable things. You cannot do it big boom bang because it does not work like this in law. Fantastic. Another, another uh, reinforcement of the message today about small steps. So thank you very, very much. And, uh, and then last but very, uh, very much not least, uh, we have uh, Darius uh, Snieszka uh, from Scania who's going to share some great experiences around the world of transport. So welcome. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. It was really interesting to, to hear and see that, I mean, all these innovative things even coming to the, to the legal practice. So, for sure, in the automotive sector, this is the sector which is driven by, the, by the, a lot of innovative solutions. So, I will talk about one concrete solution, what we have done in Lithuania, actually. Innovative solution which can help to, to tackle the CO2 reduction here and now. So, where is the... Okay, this one. Let's go ahead. Um, sustainability at Scania, that's a priority number one. Um, I will explain a bit about this slide, but, but the, the, major, the major thing what we are tackling actually is a lot of people are coming now up, uh, or speaking about the electrification, the transport electrification, and probably that's true. We also believe in this and that will happen. The question is when it will happen. And the transport business, commercial transport business, it's not exactly the same as a passenger transport business. That's a bit different solutions we can say we have to, to apply for. And we can wait until electrification will come into transport sector, in the commercial transport sector. That will probably last for several years. But in order not to wait and to tackle with the CO2 reduction here and now, we need to do something else. Because we need to reduce actually all the CO2 reductions already now at this moment, right? So CO2 reduction, there are a number of already vehicles and products which we can offer. And uh, electrification, as you see, it is actually a future, alternative future and electrification. According to transport sector or Scania beliefs, it will come probably in five to, to 10 years. But what do we do now in this, in this uh, period? The thing is that Already there are a number of vehicles in the market which is, for example, run on gas or biogas, which are already reducing CO2 reductions. Maybe not so many in Lithuania, but they are appearing. 15% natural gas reduction of CO2, maybe it's not so much, but if transport companies will start to use them, we will for sure see the effect on the CO2 reduction and also on the climate well, change at least a bit from the transport sector. And what do we see as a, as a transport company in a close, the nearest future or a slightly longer perspective? In the nearest future, of course, now we have already hybrids and, and, uh, and uh, CNG or LNG or gas vehicles which we are offering to the market. In the nearest future, what we see is for sure electrification. It's not just necessarily that truck, what you see, it's more reminds us of a trolley bus, but don't be mistaken by this. Actually, these trucks you can see in Germany and autobahns, uh, but also hydrogen. Hydrogen is the fuel or type of fuel which is now start to be more and more interested for the commercial transport producers. And in Lithuania, we thought, okay, what do we do with this? Can we somehow do a merge of this nearer future in a, sl or a slightly longer perspective? What do we do? And actually, we teamed up with uh, three partners. One partner was Esgaduyos, that's the infrastructure supplier of the gas infrastructure in Lithuania. The next uh, partner was Vilnius Gediminas Technical University, and that's the scientists, basically, who were able to, to do some tests on the, on the vehicle and on the fuel. What we did, 
together with as gadoyos, actually we try to put the hydrogen, which is already produced in Lithuania, into the gas-powered vehicles. The idea was to see if it's possible to even further reduce the CO2 reduction. So we call it Hytan test. Hytan actually it's a, it's a combination of words of, of the hydrogen and methane. So Hytan it's the cooperation yeah, between us as GDUs and the GTU. How it started actually? We approached the factory and said, the Swedish factory, Scania, and said, okay guys, can we, can we try to put this 10, 20, or 30% of hydrogen into the gas-powered vehicle? If, if, do, do we have some risk that the engine will break down or something like this? They said, maybe it will not, but you need to test it. And I mean, to test the vehicle at the factory, at the laboratory, you need to have probably apply one or two years ahead because all laboratories are so fully booked due to electrification projects, all the other projects. But we were so lucky that actually we've got that laboratory in Sweden at our factory much faster within a couple of months. And uh, we tested first with the help of the factory know-how and R&D support. We tested the, 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 the vehicle in the laboratory and then after that, we said, fine, this vehicle will, can run on the hydrogen mix of the gas. Now, try it in Lithuania on the road. Fine, we said, we have a bus and a truck. We have the vehicles. We have the infrastructure. So we started to run the test in Lithuania, and all these tests were going through all 2018 and the part of 2019 with the bus. Maybe you could see this bus on the road. It was in Vilnius, Kaunas, Klaipeda, and Cholet. Not with passengers because of the safety regions. But nothing has happened to the bus. And uh, why do we do this? We were, theoretically, we calculated that it is possible to reduce the CO2 reductions even more. Um, don't concentrate on these slides and don't try maybe to read them. That's only one of our tests one of our tests out of 100. But what we have achieved, the further reduction of CO2 emissions by at least another 13%. If we add the gas, normal gas, plus 15% of CO2 reduction, so almost 30% CO2 reduction on the standard vehicle, which you don't need to change anything with it, which you don't need to invest anything in the vehicle itself. And uh, possible to use up to 30% hydrogen mix with standard gas engine. Again, standard gas engine without any modifications. Hydrogen can be produced both ways. It can be produced from the, well, it is produced from electricity. But if you produce it from solar electricity or wind electricity, that probably you can reduce the, the CO2 reduction even more. The funny thing is that if we add biogas, and we have biogas producers in Lithuania, we can reduce this CO2 reduction by 90%. So standard solutions possible to tackle CO2 reduction here and now. Of course, there are several issues still. We are on the beginning of the road, how to say, of this gas engine's introduction in the Lithuanian market. Because as you see here, actually it's one, two, three, four, five stations at the moment, gas stations in Lithuania, where Commercial transport can fill in. It's not enough. Today or this year we will have another two uh, with the help of Esgaduyos. And hopefully that will all also a bit increase the number of, of, of the gas trucks and buses in Lithuania. There is another issue. Our LNG terminal, we have a gas. Well, it, we are not producing the gas, but we are buying the gas from, from, from the market. Unfortunately, this big amount of gas, which you see here, is spread or basically exported to other countries, avoiding Lithuanian transport companies using the LNG gas. The gas which is already now and here reducing the CO2 reductions at least 20 or even 30%. So that is an issue, of course, that is the political issue. We're also talking with that, uh, with the people in the political circles, how to do it, how to 
merge with a commercial partner, political party in order to, to get the Belufinian transport companies to use the, the, the cleaner fuel. And with this, we have two issues or, or two main points which we are working now. Actually, it's this LNG access to the public commercial transport. As I mentioned, we already start to speak with the infrastructure suppliers, with the political organizations, how we can do this, how we can increase the number of the, the CNG or LNG or gas stations in, the, in, in Lithuania. Another thing we have, as I mentioned to you, the number of the biogas producers in Lithuania. And those producers are not providing the, still this biogas for the usage of the, of, 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 of the old people or the transport companies. So cooperation of gas infrastructure providers and biogas producers, it is really needed. For example, in Latvia, they have 52 biogas farms which are now teaming up and sooner or later they will pump up this biogas into the st standard gas stations and will manage to reduce the CO2 reduction of a standard gas vehicle by 90%. So that is a short description of what we have done. Um, the test, which was successful, for sure it needs to be continued and, and what you can see, this, this truck actually, it will go to the test bench of, on Pabrade, in Pabrade of Esgeduyo's test bench already next week. We will test it again with maybe even higher amount of hydrogen. We'll see what will happen to the vehicle. But we are continuing these investigations. And at Scania, what we say, it's when you use alternative fuel, it's nothing special. It's business as usual. And in 2020, Scania are planning to produce at least every third vehicle will be with the alternative or sustainable engine. It can be gas engine, it can be ethanol engine, or, or some of them will be electrical engines. But the very important thing is that we can actually do a lot already here and now with uh, not so much of effort, the little effort, we have everything and infrastructure in Lithuania. So that's, I think, where our transport sector should go on. Thank you. Thank you very much. One, one quick question for you here. I think, thanks, this has been a, a really nice example of an innovation and inspiration that has come out of Lithuania. And perhaps for, for people in the room, you're thinking, you know, if I'm, if I'm working for, say, a Swedish or a bigger organization elsewhere, does all the innovation come only from the mothership, or is it possible to, to implement and create ideas and innovations locally? So just, just a little bit more, perhaps, on the culture on, on that side. They can be created locally as well. Uh, of course, it was a big support, especially R&D support, and uh, from the factory side, from the mother company. But uh, the, the idea, the high time idea, came from Lithuania. It came actually from our partner, Esgadujos, which said, okay, we have an idea, but we don't have the, 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 the trucks, the buses, the, the hardware. So we teamed up with the hardware, we teamed up both with the uh, Vilnius Gdynia's Technical University, so all the, actually the majority were Lithuanian ideas, which were put into the Haitan project. Super, so I think that's a really nice way to, to finish the morning. Again, you know, inspiration from ideas locally. Again, reinforcing the idea of building partnerships. You know, we've heard about that a lot today. Uh, thinking small, small steps. They don't need to be huge kind of, you know, TNT, dynamite innovations all the time. Uh, they can be from a, from a wide range here. Uh, and then the human element, of course, you know, really important to get people engaged, motivated, uh, and, uh, and a big part of the, uh, of the innovations as well. So thank you very much, uh, you. Dario. Warm welcome again. Well, thanks again for, for Dario. And, and just a few, uh, a few, final, uh, a few final words. Uh, one is uh, thanks to everybody who registered and has been here today. Um, you will all have access to the presentations so they will be uh, sent out to you after the, uh, after the session today, so you can get more from that. As we said, the, the objective of today was to, to learn about some uh, best practice, some good examples, and to get some uh, inspiration. So put your hands up. Did you get any good examples and any inspiration from today? Yeah, fantastic. Good, good, uh, good output. Uh, and then finally, big thanks to the, to the Swedish Chamber uh, for, for organizing today and uh, of course to Rocket uh, for hosting us. So there's now time for networking. Uh, there should be some more coffee available uh, just next door.
And final Thank word you, Alex. Yeah. Yes, thanks for moderating, for energizing us this morning, and just follow us on social media for the upcoming events. Huge thanks to Rocket, and have a great day.